very much, Roger. Uh, let me first introduce myself. I'm Phil Buxbaum. I was the chair of this uh, Academy report, we, and I'll go through some of the recommendations. But sp specifically, Roger's question is an excellent lead-in to looking at the statement of task, which explains uh, why this is an important thing to do. So let me get right to that. Um, we really had two tasks. The statement of task is a, is a document that uh, you know, was fully a page long. Uh, but um, if you parse it into its, uh, its parts, you see what the, uh, the various agencies were, were concerned about. Um, first of all, they, they wanted us to survey the field, the, in the uh, science and related technology, identify uh, science opportunities at the forefront of high intensity science and assess the potential impact of the associated applications and assess the status of high intensity laser engineering and technology in, in the United States. Uh, that's, of course, rather similar to, to any kind of a science study. The first thing that you do is observe what's out there. Uh, but the, uh, the more uh, important or impactful part of the charge, I think, is addressed in the second uh, part, which is to address some questions. And that is, what should be our national strategy for stewarding the science? And is there a case for a large-scale initiative to advance high-intensity science that goes well beyond the current state of the art? Is there a case for constructing US facilities? And finally, how is this technology and science being stewarded? Is it being stewarded well? And if not, is there a roadmap that we could recommend for the US to follow? So with that as context, and looking across the crowd of people who are many, many people that I know, many people from this community who are really uh, experts already, uh, let me start by pulling back to uh, a higher altitude and simply talk about what a petawatt laser is and in that way introduce why this is an interesting topic for investment in science. Um, petawatt lasers quite simply produce the brightest light on Earth, the brightest light that we know how to make on Earth. And uh, by some measures, uh, uh, particularly when combined with other infrastructure like relativistic particles, it produces the brightest light anywhere. That is, gets up to what one might call the ultimate intensity. Uh, they're, they're large, but uh, in a, a country which has uh, a number of large science infrastructure projects that are quite well known, they're not at that level. They're not billion dollar machines. Uh, on, on the other hand, they're not small. They're on the order uh, these days for advanced technology of $100 million. Uh, so they're in this interesting place in American science uh, where uh, we uh, often do have a challenge finding a way to invest. Uh, they reach high intensity by not by producing the most energy in a laser pulse, but by producing a lot of energy and then compressing it to a very short time and a very short space. So they're focusable sources and also very short pulse sources. And uh, typically, they're on the order of 100 joule class. Uh, they're not kilojoule and certainly not megajoule machines. Uh, they uh, produce, however, when focused, because they're so short, trillions of gigawatts per square centimeter. And that's really the, the, uh, the, the, where, the, where the science can find uh, new opportunities. And the reason that the study was undertaken now uh, is expressed in the following two slides. These slides are both, uh, these, the, the, both the charts here are, are, are year plots. These are the sorts of uh, plots where you see how, what happens from decade to decade or year to year. The one on the left looks like a Moore's Law type plot, semi-log, so that you can see that there's a, a geometric increase in the capability with time. This is actually the, the coin of the realm for high intensity lasers. It's how much intensity can you deliver to a point in space. And uh, we can see that that has increased at a logarithmic rate since around 1990, uh, when uh, an advance in technology uh, allowed us to get around the problem of being able to produce laser light of arbitrarily high intensity without having to worry about damage to the laser material itself that's producing the light. Just about that time, the community of scientists gets going, and you can see a steady increase in the number of publications per year on a linear, linear plot 
uh, up to the present day, and it doesn't look like it's, it's slacking off at all. Uh, this is not just a, a single science opportunity. There's a number of areas, plasma physics uh, at uh, various densities, uh, light sources, particle beam sources, uh, that can all take advantage of this technology. Now, th this next plot is, uh, there's two plots here as well. The one on the top is a map. Um, I hope you all received this wonderful four-page document, which I recommend you all to get a copy of before you, you leave. I hope you already have a copy of it. It also has a map on its second page. It's a different map. The map that I'm showing here isn't about plans, projects that need to be funded in the future. It's about what's on the ground today. And this is the world that the uh, agencies and the people who are interested in high-intensity laser research in this country confronted when they launched the study. So you can see uh, a cluster of petawatt lasers. The size of a circle is the size of the laser. The number of circles is the number of lasers. And the uh, uh, regional uh, deployment, you might say, is given in the white boxes. And uh, most of it's overseas. And that's true in spite of the fact that the technology was developed in the United States in the 90s and, and actually first uh, deployed in the US then as well. The, the bottom plot shows uh, why that or how that's happened year on year. Uh, again, divided into these three different regions, North America, Europe, and Asia. And uh, although North America started the technology way back in the 90s, uh, most of the deployment recently uh, has been in Europe. So uh, the, the committee felt that part of its charge, an important part, was to unravel exactly why that happened. Uh, that is, um, what were the opportunities that the Europeans were seeing, and how did they muster their resources to get this to happen? And uh, so there is, uh, in, in fact, uh, much of a chapter in the report that's, divided, that, that's devoted to uh, the kind of coordinated effort that the European science community was able to seed and then bring to bear on uh, the, uh, the, the people who, who make the rules about how to deploy large funds in Europe for infrastructure. And right now, the Europeans uh, are uh, certainly uh, leading the infrastructure uh, race there, although China, as you can see, also is a player. So uh, with that as the charge, the Academy put together a panel of experts. Their names are shown here. Uh, there are four of us here in, in the room, uh, unless somebody snuck in that I hadn't noticed. Uh, Peter Moulton, who will speak later, and, and I and are, are both members of the committee. And then also Howard Milchberg is here and Lou DeMauro. They were also both members of the committee. We had an aggressive study schedule. Uh, the whole process took two years, but most of the information gathering happened in the calendar year 2016 including lots of field visits to US facilities, to, Europe, to one, one field visit to the European large uh, uh, infrastructure uh, laser facility that's uh, still under construction and commissioning. We met uh, pretty much uh, every other week by phone. We drafted dozens of position papers. Uh, we uh, wrote up our draft and delivered it to the Academy in, in April. Uh, the contents of the report is shown on right. It's a 300-page report, but it's well summarized for the purposes of, of today in that four-page report that you have with you. So let me go over the conclusions now, and then I'll be able to pass the baton over to the other panelists who have had a chance to uh, look at the report and think about how to present it. Uh, first study conclusion, you might say this is a study conclusion that probably often appears in Academy reports as its first conclusion is that the science is important. Actually, uh, we, we, were, uh, we were really impressed, not only with the importance of the science, but with the breadth of the science areas covered. Applications exist in several areas, the, despite the uh, rather advanced nature of the environment produced by these lasers. Nonetheless, uh, there are great opportunities for applications in, again, across several fields. We found that the community in the US is large, but it's fragmented. And uh, that's because several agencies support this work. And they support it uh, according to their missions. But they don't support uh, so much, uh, cro in, in most cases, they don't support so much uh, cross-communication and, and working together. And, uh, and, and in particular, there's no cross-agency steward. That is, there's no uh, agency that says, we're not only steward 
for our own missions use of these, this scientific area, but also for the entire US effort. That doesn't exist here. Um, largely as a result of that, the US has lost its previous dominance. That was one of our conclusions. Um, we found that co-location with existing infrastructure is essential. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, the Europeans are, are, are not doing so much. Uh, and it's, uh, in fact, one of the biggest unmet needs of the uh, science community uh, internationally. And finally, uh, university laboratory and industry cooperation is necessary. And I think Liz already spoke to this in her introductory remarks, because the Harnessing Light 2 survey, the optics and photonics uh, uh, survey that was done a few years ago made the same point. So we laid out a recommendations roadmap in response to uh, this second part of our charge. Uh, that no, no, that uh, recommendation uh, list is largely about organizing. Uh, the most important unmet need and the thing that needs to happen first is to organize a broad network of the stakeholders uh, so that they're talking to each other and so that they can speak together to agencies and to the government about what their needs are. Uh, and that's our second recommendation, engage them to do that, to define specific research needs. Um, the third recommendation goes directly to this issue of stewardship. We must develop in this country a multi-agency steward stewardship strategy. Uh, we looked at all of the agencies that were involved in this field, and uh, we felt it was important to point out that uh, the Department of Energy is best equipped to lead this, but it needs to be an interagency strategy. Uh, our fourth recommendation is to build one or more major facilities in the US that leverage the advantages of co-location in US laboratories. And our fifth recommendation, which is not fifth because it's least important, but rather because uh, it has to be viewed in the context of the others, is that we have to create programs for technology development that go along with this science development and research engagement. And most important is to uh, allow US scientists and engineers to be able to fully take advantage of international facilities, particularly the international facilities that are being commissioned right now in uh, Europe. So taken together, these recommendations lay out a roadmap. This is what we were asked to do. It's a strategy for high intensity laser science and technology and how it can be carried out in this country uh, in the future. So thanks, Roger. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.